morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. It's always a blessing to have everyone in at the very last day of the year. And I know most of us are looking forward to a new year, I think. But we're very excited about that. Pastor Lapino, would you hold us in a word of prayer, please, this morning, brother? You know, as we begin a new year, I was thinking of what we want to maybe start with. And of course, we're going to be in chapter 15 this morning. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles there this morning, we'll be continuing our study there. But, you know, let us as children of light seek to walk in light. I think that's a great message to consider as we're finishing up this year and beginning a new year. Let us really think about that, that we are truly the children of light. If you're here this morning as a child of God, you know that you're saved. You are a child of God. You know, God is not only infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, has an unchangeable spirit. He's the perfect being in whom all things begin and continue and end thinking about that just a few minutes. Wow. And yet at the same time, and it might be even another way of saying that God is perfect when we say that God is light. We don't say that God is light. God is light, isn't he? Jesus Christ proclaimed that he is the light of the world, and therefore he is our light as well. We just thank the Lord for all of this. We think about how we can just diligently as children of God here seek him out at any time, day or night through prayer, any time that we have any challenge, anything at all, and recognize he's always with us at all times, no matter what we may be facing. What a wonderful thing this is. And the very privilege that we have of having his very word in our home and in our hand, and the ability we have to have a place like this to come to be able to worship. I think by God's grace, we can say that we have much to be thankful for, and we have much to look forward to recognizing that everything is known of God before it ever comes to pass as well. What a privilege to know that we can have a personal relationship with him, isn't it? A personal relationship with him. So now as we begin our study in chapter 15, I just thought I wanted to share that with the class this morning as something to maybe give us a little encouragement this year to really kind of seek out and understand how blessed we are, no matter what the circumstances may hold, what tomorrow may hold, we truly know the one that does, and we can walk in the light because God has purpose for us as long as we're here, and we need to be in tune to that. But with several points looking at last week's study, we saw that Jesus said, I am the true vine, and we saw how the Jewish people compared God with, a, with uh, I mean, compared the, 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 blind, the, the vine with, uh, with Israel. We looked at that in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, and we looked at a couple of passages there. Then we looked in the New Testament, and we saw how in, in Matthew, the, the, um, the parable that, that the Lord gave concerning that evil uh, husbandman that had be, basically beaten and stoned and murdered the various ones that the, that the nobleman had sent back to his vineyard to get the things from it. And what was he talking about? We know this was just a day or two before, right now, of all that's going on, when he gave that specific message. What was he really talking about? Well, he was talking about Israel, wasn't he? He was explaining to them the state of Israel and what had happened with them. But now, as we see in chapter 14, there's a big change. I mean, in chapter 15, when he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Complete change. Now it's in him. We talk about the intimacy that we have with, 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 with Jesus through that and with the Lord. You know, we saw how we were to be fruitful, and how, how when we're fruitful, how, that resu resu uh, how, how the results, when, when we learn how to really true, the, the true secret of truly abiding with the Lord in, in the first few verses there. We also mentioned last week a couple of important things to consider, things that are going on here. We saw how in the, um, and when we, of course, we haven't studied Daniel in a while, but we talked briefly about it, but in Daniel chapter 2, we saw how Nebuchadnezzar, with, that, with the empire that he set up, the Babylon, that was the first empire that marked the uh, supremacy that they were to have in the world. Israel was going to lose the, spirit, the, the, uh, the, that, the, the national supremacy that they were supposed to have in the world at that point, and it began the time of the Gentiles. But in this verse, where we're coming to in our study now, we see something else happening now. Israel is now going to lose, they're going to lose something else. They're going to lose that spiritual supremacy that they were to have in the world as well. 
They were to be the leaders, but that also was going to now be taken from them and given to another as we kind of consider these verses. Just quickly reading over those first few verses we looked at last week, in John 15, 1 it says, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branches cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We see a wonderful picture here, don't we? Jesus does a couple of things. First of all, he assures his disciples of a continuous connection with him in, their, in, their, in that relationship, even though he was literally about to leave, and they were really beginning to understand it, as we talked a little bit about that last week. But you know, the way he spoke this, when we look at this, it indicates also there's an aspect of choice, isn't there? They can choose you, we can choose to follow the Lord, or we can choose to go into the world, can't we? We want to keep those things in mind. So we see that a parting, uh, that the abiding was something that they literally must choose to do. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, I am the vine, you're the branches, because they were so accustomed to thinking of Israel as the vine. And though mainly in terms of their connection to Israel, but now Jesus wanted them to see him as the vine, the true vine, not just the vine, but the true vine and emphasize that wonderful connection that they would have, have with him. You see, you think about that for a few minutes, think of the intimacy that there has to be between the two, doesn't there? They're so close, they're literally one, one with the other. It makes me think of the term that we read in the New Testament when it says, being in Christ. You love that term? I do that. I love when I see it in the Bible and it says, in Christ, I used to just get so excited about that. I think you can tell you it's a lot of things I'd be talking about. Boy, in Christ, it just meant so much that we literally have the privilege of being in Christ. And of course, we know that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we enjoy today. Yes, he said that. And now they were to think of Jesus. Think of Jesus as the vine, emphasizing that connection. And that was where the new, this, this new uh, spiritual leadership was to be coming from. You know, when we think about this, outside of that, when he said, without me you can do nothing, it isn't that the disciples can't have an active, can't be active or work without Christ, is it, or without Jesus? They could have activity without him. And we certainly see this with his enemies, don't we, and others. They have lots of activities. They call religion, they call different things, but it's really not, it's not right. Yet they and we can do nothing real, eternal, of eternal value without Jesus. All the good works that one may do through the flesh are in vain. We know that from the Word of God, don't we? They're vanity. We may do all kinds of wonderful things in the world, but we're looking at those things to be the things that are, that are, that are, uh, that are, uh, that are going to get us to heaven or anything. We're looking in the wrong place, aren't we? We know that what needs to be done must be done through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can trust him to lead God and direct us, and he will direct us unto good works. He said, I am, and Spurgeon talks about the I am here, he says, that comes out of a personal word for me, and, and, and the claim of all power. It really unveils his omnipotent, and the word he put, he, Spurgeon says, the word means Godhead, or it means nothing at all. You either see it as the Godhead, or you don't see it at all. He goes on to say, without me, you can do nothing. And Spurgeon says here, he says, if this be true of the apostles, much more for the oppressors. Okay? Well, so they can't do anything without him either. If his friends can do nothing without him, he says, I'm sure his foes can do nothing against him. And it's true. Did they really take Jesus to the cross? Did Jesus fight because he couldn't, he didn't want to go and he, he didn't have any control over it to what was going to happen to him? Or could he have stopped it at any moment? Could he change anything with his very word? 
Absolutely. So we, we can see how God has a plan and a purpose, eternal purpose in all things, and the wonderful gift of life that we have through him from his very entering into this world as we just, as we just celebrated uh, uh, just last week, as well as now, as we said, getting him as his go going to, to that, that all that has been paid for for you and I through him. Yes, without me, we can do nothing. Apart from Christ, no man or woman has what it takes to live the Christian life, do we? We may think that we can be really good. We can do all the right things. We can give to the poor, be on church every Sunday. We can do everything that we can to be a great person, be a nice person, and do all those wonderful things. It doesn't do a thing for us, does it? And the reason I'm kind of emphasizing this this morning, I know most of you know this, but we kind of forget sometimes that a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. They're still thinking that I'm good enough. I'm better than Joe next door. You know, Bill down the street, I know I'm better than he is. Now, Bob might be a little better than I am, but I'm doing all right. The Lord's going to look at me and say, hey, he's okay. That's not the way it works. And that's what we really have to understand. Apart from Christ, no man or woman has what it takes to live the Christian life. Because what? It is a supernatural life, isn't it? If you're in Christ today, you, you, you have a supernatural life. You have been given immediately eternal life. You've been given discernment through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The only person who could ever live that life was Christ himself. And of course, anyone who's ever tried to live, live the life of Christ, uh, that life apart from Christ knows that literally it's impossible to do so. We, we can't do it. But so many today are believing that it's the church or the pastor or or their good works, or they were born into the right family, or their family has been a Christian ever since they've, they, they've known. And they've never really come to the place of receiving that gift of life through Jesus Christ, which must happen in that specific way. You see, the other thing that we should learn from this, we need to know that our lives are lived in the Lord how? Moment by moment, aren't they? Step by step. Second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, year by year. We had the very privilege of knowing that we can, day by day, walk with the Lord if we will seek Him out. Now to suggest that I'm doing that, I can't. What I can say is I seek to do that at times. I need to seek to do it more often. And one of our challenges maybe this year is to try to do things like that more. So if I'm going to seek the Lord out, how am I going to do that? What do I do? Well, first of all, I recognize Him. I have to recognize Him in every part of my life that He's there with me. And recognize that I'm not responsible to the world. My responsibility is to Him and to count on Him and to do the things that I have been taught to do through his word, and to follow that path, and to look for his leading and his guiding in all that I think, say, and do in every part of the day, and continuously talk to him, because he's there for me to talk to. But also, very important, is if I'm going to understand what it is, I need to be in the word. I need to be spending some real quality time in the word, don't I? really studying and learning and letting the Lord speak to me through that. Let him show me the things that I need to do in my life. And we can do those things by God's grace. I think this year it's going to be more important than ever that we look like that. I think it's going to be harder and harder to walk in this world and have more challenges than we're used to having, even more so than what we faced in the past. And it might be much more difficult. But we need to be firmly planted. As I looked at Homer's shirt this morning with the with the roots in it. We need to truly have the Word of God truly planted in our lives. Yes, the Lord is teaching them and teaching us how we are to abide in Him through the Holy Spirit. Now, they hadn't received the Holy Spirit up to this point, but He was preparing, but he was preparing for them to, to receive it so that they would understand. And we, we've talked about our also Israel as we know it's represented in the Old Testament. We talked about Matthew and what the Lord had to say there. 
So that was against the, so we wanted to go against that background as we studied last year to lay that foundation of what this I am is when Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. That's a wonderful relationship that's now being developed and formed. Yes, sir? Exactly. Well, that's what we're getting to. <laughs> you always get ahead of me, Homer. But no, that was real good, though. Exactly right. But they're exactly the same. And what Homer was saying is that basically, you know, the one cannot exist without the other. And last week, you may recall how we talked a little bit about that. And what was the responsibility of a vine? It was the vine itself to the one, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the branch. What was the responsibility of the, of the branch? It was to the vine and only to the vine. We don't have to worry about all the others. They're attached to that vine. They're responsible for their own fruit and what they're doing in their lives. So we had the individual there, but we also had the collectiveness of that as well. And it is with the fathers he brought in in that first verse when it says, I am the true vine, but the husbandman is the father. And so we want to definitely see that. Now in verse 6 it goes on to say, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they all burn. As I did my study, I was amazed to learn, you know what a vine, you know what, what good a vine is, what good vine wood is for? Hmm? That's it. That's all you can use it for. It, it is not good for furniture. You can't make anything with it. Nothing else. And, the, and that was the point here. It has one, the one purpose. So we see in this verse that although it may apply to anyone who made a profession of Christ, there are many today that profess to be Christians. It's very popular, at least it was earlier, certainly a few years back. I think when they do the surveys, they were like 60, 70, 80 percent of most, most people claim to be Christians. But there's a fallacy there because many of them don't believe the Bible. Many of them don't necessarily, they deny the truth of Christ. It's a very dangerous place to be. We talk about that. Sometimes people tell you, well, I have my own relationship, a very special, it's different than, you know, that's not important. I, I have my own, I, I know how God is, and it's a very special relationship. Jesus Christ and the Lord and God have made a way that we can know him, and that's only through his word. And we have to understand his word is truth. He goes on to say, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. We talk about that. Don't need much there. Okay, Lord, I, I'm going to pray because I really want a new Mercedes. I'd like to have it next week. I, you know, I kind of need it. I got to show up to my friends. You know, they're, they're getting some nice, they got some BMWs and all that. Other. I got to have one too. Look right. Is the Lord going to answer my prayer? No. You know the kind of prayer he's interested in? One that glorifies him. One that is reaching out to others. One that sees those, those kind of needs and those that are sought after that will bring us closer to the Lord. Those are the kind of prayers we should be thinking about and praying. We want to look at those things. Then he goes on in verse 8 and he says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall, so shall ye be my disciples. You know, we talked about the branch only has life, as you just mentioned before, as it's connected to the stock or the vine. That's the disciple or the Christian. And this type of life we're talking about is what? Is it physical life? Not specifically. He's really talking about the more important life. He's talking about the spiritual life that we're to have. And we only have that if we're connected to the master, to, to the vine itself. The phrase Jesus uses, I think here, is very important too that we look at. Notice, notice what he didn't say, for example. He didn't say, if anyone does not bear fruit, he is cast out. Is that what he said? No, what does he say? He says, if anyone does not abide in, what? In me, divine, but in me. What is important? Remember we talked about last week the uh, gifts of the Spirit and looking at Christ and who Christ is? to walk in the Spirit, to walk in truth, to walk in love. These are the things that we are to do. You know, by, if we do that by nature, we are going to now have a new nature. That new nature is going to glorify the Lord. We're going to do the things that please the Lord. 
And therefore, there's going to be that kind of fruit in our lives, isn't there? So these are things that we just want to see. People get that verse mixed up too because they want it to say, well, you see, you're not doing anything. You've got to go out and do stuff for the Lord. You need to be doing this and doing that. I need to see your works. Those works should come to us because it's our nature to do them. Does that mean you can just sit back and wait for them to fall down and happen? Disciple means discipline, doesn't it? We need to have some discipline in our lives to be focusing on these things and doing, walking the way that we should. We talked about the men gathering them, throwing them into the fire. We talked about that, that they're really good for nothing but burning. And the reference to burning fire, some, some pointed out in some of the uh, commentaries I looked at, of course has a reference to hell. Well, it, it has a reference to several things, as we'll see in a moment. You know, and I think that what we want to look at here is, a, is really there's a great warning here concerning the falling away of not abiding. In other words, there's a great warning here concerning apostasy. You know, there's many today that are going to church thinking that they're saved, and they're not. There's a lot that are trusting, like we just said, in the wrong things, and they don't know the difference. They have never sought it out. They believe what they, they, they believe the church is going to save. They believe that they've burned the right amount of candles. They've done this, they've done that, and therefore they're in good shape. If I get on a bus and I'm trying to go to Miami and it's going to Jacksonville, am I going to get to Miami? I'm going the wrong direction, aren't I? Even if I think all the way on the whole bus, I'm going to, I'm going to Miami. It doesn't change anything, does it? We need to do it. We need to get the right deal. We need to understand what the Word of God says about how we're to be saved, and that's putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And there's no other way. And we must actually receive Him. As Pastor used to say, there's a date and time. Most of us don't, may not be able to remember whatever date and time. But we know in our lives there was a time, a date and time, that we came and we asked Jesus to come in and save us. And we knew from that moment on that we were saved doesn't mean we don't go a little like this, does it? Have a little doubt sometimes because we think, well, you know, but we realize I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he says I'm saved and I know I ask him to be saved and I know that I believe that I'm saved and therefore I'm saved, right? We know that through his word. You see, told, Jesus told them that he would depart, yet they would not be disconnected from him. The work of the Holy Spirit sent by the Father would keep them Connected to Jesus. Now, as we've talked a little bit about last week, but I do want to still talk about this a little bit this week, there's basically three ways that people interpret this in a spiritual or in a, in, in, in a sense of, of security, and we hear, we hear it quite often. One of those views, the first one I'll just use is the view where believers are cast out, uh, the cast out branches uh, are the ones who, though once were true believers, notice that word, they once were true believers, and end up in hell for lack of abiding, for abiding, for 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 for, for, uh, for the lack of abiding fruit and any fruit. So they were once disciples, but are now cast out. That's wrong, right? I think I don't. Oh, we're going to go into that. Just a minute. we don't need to go too much into it. The second view, this one has a little more credibility. But it says these are the ones that were cast out that were only appeared to be disciples and who never really abided in Jesus. Therefore, they go to hell. That would be someone like a Judas Iscariot, for example, who was there doing all the right things. Even the, uh, I think most of the other apostles believed that he was truly one of them, and then to find out that it really wasn't. And the third view is sees, sees the cast out branches as just fruitless disciples who live wasted lives and are uh, effectively burned up, like the passage does, referring to, to, to the eternal destiny. We look at somebody like that, maybe like a Lot, who if you just read the Old Testament, you might think, how in the world was Lot ever saved? But we know from the Word of God that he was. We get to uh, the uh, book of Hebrews. So we see these things and we get a little confused sometimes. The emphasis, I think, seems plain. There's no true disciple who do not abide. The branches must remain connected to the vine or it has no life and is, has no lasting good. Do you think that God here is contradicting himself? Why would he, how could he contradict himself? Because he says so plainly and so often in the book of John, things like, one who receives Christ is what? Born of God. 
he says, one who believes in Christ shall never perish. One who puts his trust in Christ has everlasting life and shall not be into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Does Jesus contradict himself? No, he does not. These are absolute truths, and we know that. We also know that if you're a child of God, you hear his voice. We are told that the Christ sheep hear his voice and follow him. And he gives unto them eternal life and tells them they shall never perish. So God does not hear or contradict his word. The sad fact is that many Christians do kind of wither away sometimes and become powerless in their failure to live the Christian life. These are verses we all know in Ephesians. We all know, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. But let's look at that in a little more context here this morning. This is an excellent verse, an excellent verses when we're out there and we have an opportunity to witness and people are not understanding grace, what it is to be saved by grace and grace alone. To understand that it has nothing to do with them or their works or, or anything else. It has everything to do with our Lord. When it tells us in Ephesians 2, 5, it says, even when we were dead in sins, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Quickeneth means what? Alive means alive unto us, and, uh, and hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and have raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace ye are saved. You are saved through faith. What is the only condition of salvation here? Faith, isn't it? Isn't it faith? That's the only condition he's saying. For by grace you are saved, his grace, our faith, that they haven't had that faith, and that not of yourselves. Is that important? I No matter how much good works, how much I think I'm going to do, how much right I do, how much I think I can change my life or anything else, it has nothing to do with my salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with me. He makes it very clear, it's one thing. It is a gift of God. Exactly. Exactly. It all is. Everything is. And he makes sure that we understand that in the very next verse when he says, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us have any right to boast of our salvation. It wasn't because I got good enough, Bill, that I got saved and you didn't. That's what it was. You just didn't do it right. I did. It's not that at all, is it? It's because I came to the point in my life that I knew I was lost and without hope. And I knew I needed a Savior. And I knew that I was a sinner and there was nothing I could do about it. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And at that very moment, He saved me. And at that very moment, I received the Holy Spirit in this dispensation. But it doesn't stop there because it does go on to say one more verse here that we want to share. It says, for we are his, what? Workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. That's through Christ. The good works are to come. They'll be manifest in us, which God had before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. When do we walk in them? Well, Sunday morning's a good morning. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go walk in, those, in that. It should be every day, every part of every day. Yes, my friend, the Bible is quite clear. We cannot lose our salvation. So if we're saved, we're saved. But we need to be very cautious, too, of many that think that they're saved, that they really have never really put their trust in Jesus Christ, recognizing that He is God. And that the only true way to be saved is to come to Him and ask Him to save them and receive that through faith. And by, by that, believing on him that he is who he says he is, and that they are saved. You know, let us be about our Father's business as children of light. In 1 Corinthians 3.8, it goes on to talk a little bit more about how, what we do as, as, chil as children of God. It says, now he that is, I'm sorry, now, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Isn't that interesting? I, you know, Homer may plant, I may get the water, but it's God's going to give the increase. But you see, that the, the point is, is that that's one work. It's all one work, because who's really doing the work? The Lord, isn't he? 
the Spirit, we're using the Spirit, but He's using us as He should. And it says, it says uh, have watered one, and every man should receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are not God's husbandry, ye, ye, uh, ye, ye are God's, and, and ye are God's building. Ye are God's husbandry, and ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he, how he uh, buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that is, that is laid, which, Jesus, which is Jesus Christ. Now please notice this. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest. For that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. There's that fire again we talked about before, the fire. Okay, now this is what it goes on to say, uh, the fire. And the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. If any man's works abide, which he had built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But please notice, he himself shall be saved. Saved. You see, there's going to be a time of trying to fire. That is how that work is done. The work is done by us trusting in Christ, walking the path that he has for each of us, and allowing the, through the indwelling of the Spirit, to be used of him. That is the truth of where we are to be with him. And he says, you know, uh, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? Oh, how much we have here. You see, God's word is true and he does not contradict himself as he has said so plainly and so often in the book of John. One who receives Christ is born of God. One who believes in Christ shall never perish and one who puts trust in Christ at the everlasting life, and shall come, and, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We can look at John five twenty four, where he said, "Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life." Yes, God is not contradicting what He has said elsewhere. The subject here is fruit bearing. The sad fact is that many Christians wither away and become powerless and fruitless, and thus are kind of a, have lived kind of a failed Christian life. The emphasis does seem plain. There are no true disciples who do not abide. The branches must be connected to the vine, or it has no life and no long lasting good. He said, "My words abide in you." Jesus connected. Jesus uh, is connected. Abiding. Uh, uh, Jesus is connecting an abiding idea to the idea that faithfulness to His Word, as previous mentioned, there is, there is nothing outside that is not done through the Lord, and it's our faithfulness that we're to be faithful to His Word. And how can I be faithful to His Word? I think I have to know His Word, don't I? I have to take time to to take that word in. I need to take time to be alone with the Lord and seek out his, his counsel through his word. And as I do that, the Lord is going to work in my heart and in my life and help me to grow. In John 14, 23, it reads, it says, it says, if any man, Jesus says, if any man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me keepeth my, he, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. What he's saying there is, I'm telling you this, but the word that you hear, that I'm saying about myself, is the word of the Father. What the Father says about me, through me, that's what he's saying here. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, and he defines him here, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So here we see what you mentioned earlier, 
we see the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. He's going to glorify the Son of God as the Son of God glorified the Father. We see all three working in this, don't we? As, as we see through the Word of God. In verse 9 it says, As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. I don't know about you, but that's a powerful verse. The love of Jesus for his people is absolutely remarkable. Notice what he said. He didn't say the, the, the love that a mother has for her child or her baby. He didn't say about the love that a husband has for his wife or his wife has for, 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 his, for the husband. It wasn't like that. He says, what kind of love? He says the love, he said the love that, that, uh, that, 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 that he has, that the Father has for the Son is the kind of love that he's talking about that he has for us. Wow, that is really quite a statement, isn't it? That's the only way he could paint a picture in a way that love, that we were to see how the love, the love of the Father was for the Son. This surely is Christ's is Christ magnifying his word concerning the love of his own. It leaves nothing more to be said in reality. What can you say It's any greater than that love? Yeah, it's the glorification. What the love of the Father is for the Son, who can tell? The very suggestion fills the soul with a sense of profound depths which cannot be fathomed. We can think of a couple of things with the Father and the Son's love. First of all, it has no beginning. Nor does it have any end. It's always there. It's close and personable, personal. Think about it. If you're here as a child of God, you can have a personal, and we should have a personal relationship with the Lord. That's really something, isn't it? The Lord God who created everything that is, it is everything before everything, after everything, I can know Him. I can know Him. I can grow in Him. And he wants me to do that. It's a love without any measure either. You can't measure it. There's no end. There's no beginning to it. And it's absolutely unchangeable at the same time. The consistency of, you know, people get divorced sometimes, this happened, that happened. And they say, well, I just don't love them anymore. Huh? I just don't love them anymore? That's changeable, isn't it? Well, this love is never changeable. All he says is always going to be, and just as his love always will be. There you go. That's right. We're going to get there. He says, and if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, Jesus connects that true discipleship with obedience, notice, to his commands. There's obedience involved in this and honoring his word. Jesus fulfills this in, a, in regard to his Father, as we look at how he related to his father, he was the perfect man in this world. He showed us how we he, to live in perfect dependency as he did upon the father. He's telling us now to live in complete dependency upon him, upon the Lord as well. Jesus fulfilled this in regard to his father. The disciples should seek fulfillment in this regard. In verse 11, he says, Then these things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. You know, we think of joy most of the time. What do you think of? Happiness. Wow, I'm going to be happy. Joy, we think of it being happy or excited about something. That's what we think of when we think of it. But you know what he speaks of here isn't that kind of excitement. That's, that's not what he's talking about. The joy Jesus is talking about is the exhilaration of being right with God, of being in the right relationship with the Lord. That's what he's talking about and consciously walking in his love and in his care. We can have that joy, and we can have, we might just call it, his joy, and have it in, an abund and have it in the abundance of presence. In verse 12, he goes on to say, this is my commandment. A commandment, well, that means I can either take it or leave it, right? Doesn't sound like that. He says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. You know, this is a special law of Christianity called here in the New Testament, the, the, in, 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 in the New Testament here, the, the, new, the, the new commandment. In John chapter 13, 31, in our previous study, we looked at this briefly. 
in verse 34, but I'm going to start in verse 31 and read this one through. It says, therefore, he, uh, when he was gone out, speaking of Jesus, said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God, being, if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, please notice, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, and ye also love one another. That's his commandment. So what's so new about that? The Old Testament, we saw it. The newness of it was in the way that relationship was to be fulfilled. The way that relationship was going to be fulfilled. And he goes on to say that by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As I have loved you, that's what the tender affection that will endure the trials, the practice of self-denial, and if need be, to lay down one's life for another. That's true love, isn't it? In 1 John 3.13, it said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth not in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life and have, have, have eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Those, aren't those some precious verses right there too as well? As we talk about the love, and we're talking about how we're to abide in it, and the way that we're to be with our brothers, and to recognize that. And what he's saying is, you know, he's not just saying, do what I say, is he? He's saying, do what I do. Did he not lay his life down for us, for you and I? What a blessing. In verse 13, he goes on to say, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. No man can carry his love for friends further than this. For when one gives up his life, he's literally given up all that he has. The proof of my love for you, I shall give in a few hours. The Lord basically didn't say it quite like that, but that's what he's talking about. And the doctrine which I recommend to you, I, I'm, just, I'm just going to exemplify through myself. In verse 14 goes on to say, please notice, what a wonderful verse. Ye are my friends, friends, wow, friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Please notice that latter part too, whatsoever I command you. They were friends, they were friends because they were obedient, but they weren't perfectly so. We all know that, right? Just as you and I, we're not perfect in everything. You know, no matter how we, how we seek to follow the Lord, we're not perfect. But we seek to do that. Friends with Jesus cannot be disconnected from obedience to his commandments. It must be actively, we must be actively obedient. And, 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 and notice that ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. So, so think it is equally, I mean, uh, that it is quite sufficient if they avoid what is, uh, some, uh, as we go, some think that it's really quite, quite sufficient if they just avoid things that are for, forbidden. Or they might abstain from evil, is a, or, or, or uh, evil is a, is a great part of righteousness, but it's not enough for true friendship. Let me do that again. This is what Spurgeon said. I'm trying to read what he said. Spurgeon said, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Some think it's quite sufficient if they avoid what, what, what is forbidden. Abstain from evil is a great part of righteousness, but it's not enough for friendship. The Lord followers will be fruitful, and fruitfulness results from when we learn the secrets of truly abiding, to be right with the Lord. The price of abiding and promising, and the promise to those who do abide, the emphasis seems plain. They are not, there are no true disciples who do not abide, the branch must remain connected to the vine or it will have no life, no longer. So God is not contradicting his words, we said earlier. 
The sad fact is that many Christians wither away and become powerless and thus fail in his Christian life. Yes, we see this. And then verse 15, it goes on to say, Henceforth I call you my servants. I call you not my servants. For, for the servant knoweth not what his, what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have, no, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whosoever, that, what, that whatsoever ye shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give you. You know, Jesus just spoke a great, of the great privileges for, for the disciples. Friendship with the Master, answer to prayer, bearing much fruit, and knowing the things from the Father all were part of what we have as, as, as children of God. The disciples should rightly treasure these without being proud, as if they had earned them. They were all rooted in the fact that Jesus chose them, not that they, not, not that they chose him. We are Christ, not because we hold him, but because he holds us. In verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. There's one more secret in, ab in, in, in abounding, in abounding in, in, in it, and this is a key, a, a, key, a key part of it, that we have the friendship of, of, of Jesus. The Lord has commanded his disciples to love one another. A way to see truth is to consider, maybe consider it with, with, if you look at a wheel that has spokes on it. I think of a wagon wheel when I used to watch all the westerns, which I enjoy watching. You see a spoke. What do you see with a spoke? They start off like this and they go like this toward the hub, right? So how do we get closer to those that, that we love, that should, should love in, in the faith? As we move closer to the Lord, we're going to automatically be moving closer to them. And they're going to be moving closer to us. So all of these things are important. Yes, sir? Yep. Yeah, that's actually the same night. That's all taking place right at the same time as this. It's just a little later on that same evening that's going on there. Yeah. No, it, but that chapter 13, 14, 15 are all taking place all almost like that. I'm going to ask, we're out of time. So, uh, uh, Homer, would you close this morning, please, sir? Amen. I, just, I want to close with this one last thing, so just saying this. As we start a new year, let us seek to draw closer to the Lord and each other, as we've been seeing in our study. Let us walk in the light and remember that we're not of this world. This world is not our home, but we do have a home, don't we? And it's been permanently set aside, and it is our home. And we should be seeking to be the light that we should be in this world at this time. Thank you.